the scene. And the scene is this. It's Dorothy Gale of Kansas walking through her disheveled, drab, dirty farmhouse as she reaches for that door and opens it into the pristine, crisp, colorful world of Oz. Whether you've seen the movie or not, you know that scene. And I love the magic of that scene. I loved it as a kid and I love it as an adult. And when I heard the theme of this TED Talk, Awakening, I immediately went to that scene. Like the camera over Judy Garland's sepia toned shoulder and then zooming in to the panoramic technicolor. Oh my gosh, the power, the hope in that. And I was like, that, that has to be central to my talk. So I started to think about Dorothy and I started to think about her journey through Oz and I started to think about the story arc. And then I got sad. I was like, wow, here we have our heroine, a woman who dreams of going over the rainbow, of living in a world of color. I believe she sings a line and where your biggest dreams can come true, right? And she gets there and all she wants to do is go back to Kansas. <laughs> what? No, like you're, you're, you're there. You sang about it and you're there. So why do you want to go back? Now I get it. She's under the impression that her poor old Auntie Yum is sick, right? Keep in mind that she thinks this because an old white man conned her into thinking it, right? <laughs> Speaking of, that same old white man happens to be governing that land that she landed in behind a curtain, projecting a much bigger image of himself to pretend that he has power and magic he doesn't really have. Can anybody say patriarch? <laughs> but that's a different TED talk. Okay, back to Dorothy and back to her dream world. So let's just assume that Auntie M really is sick. So I totally give credit to Dorothy for wanting to go back and take care of her family. But you know, I was thinking about it, I'm like, why can't Uncle Henry step up? He's there, <laughs> right? You got three farm hands, you know? There's a, plenty of people to help out. Or maybe, maybe Auntie M could come to Oz. Or maybe there's like a seasonal timeshare thing where like Dorothy could do winters in Oz and summers in Kansas. Why does Dorothy have to give up her color and her dream because of this? And I wanna, uh, you know, I was thinking about this and, I, and the more I thought about it, the more I got hung up on this part of the dream dilemma is that once we're there, if we're lucky enough to get there, what are the issues that pull us back? There's external pressures, there's internal pressures, and they're all very real, right? But here's a perfect example. I can't see any of your faces or your hands, so this is gonna be kind of a moot experience, but please raise your hand if you've ever gone to a man pedicure, a spa, massage, haircut, and felt guilty. I hear a lot of shifting in seats. <laughs> So I'm just gonna assume that that number is pretty high. Because as women, we're always, when we're here and we're taking care of ourselves, we're always pulled back. I'm pretty sure that there's an excellent movie out there, something about a tall blonde chick, and there's a monologue about how we are constantly pulled in these different directions. That we are taught as women to dream big, to rise and hustle, to break the glass ceiling. But once we're there, we have commitments. We have mortgages, we have relationships, we have family members. We have all of those very real things that in the wor words of Al Pacino, once you're out, they pull you back in. <laughs> so I wanna talk about that. But that's only part of our dream dilemma, right? Is that constant pull between what we want to be doing and what we should be doing, where we're at, where we need to be, and how do those two worlds constantly contradict each other? and the inner turmoil that comes with that. Those external pressures are very real, but there's also these internal pressures, and they come in the shape of fear. It smells like self-doubt, and it is the weight of guilt that pulls us away from our dreams. So, I thought it would be kind of fun for all of us to go to Oz together. What do you think? <laughs> Does anybody here, is anybody here wearing red sparkly shoes? 
No, shoot, because I thought we could like click our heels and then all go there. So I guess what we have to do is the next best thing. Let's pull out our Waze or Google Apps and let's set our destination. But what do we have to do first? We have to select our current location. And yeah, there's gonna be a little pop-up block that says, do you allow Google to track your location? And you're just gonna hit allow, okay? So I thought we could do a group exercise. It's actually gonna be an individual thing, but we're gonna do it collectively as a group. I want you to close your eyes. I'm not gonna close my eyes because I'm on stage and I feel like that would be weird. But if you feel comfortable, please close your eyes and I'm gonna ask you three questions. And I want you to get still and think about them. The first question is, where am I? Where am I? The second question is, who am I? Who am I? And the third question is, what am I? What am I? Now you can either leave your eyes closed or you can open them but I think that those questions are so important. And I'm not talking about, I am here at Imagination Stage, my name is Amanda, and I am a speaker at a TED Talk event. No, what I'm talking about is finding your soul's starting point. Where are you right now? What, where is there a disconnect? How do you define yourself? For the longest time, I defined myself by my career. It was what I did, right? I was a marketing communications professional for a healthcare IT firm. <laughs> I'm so important, right? And I, and I was, I was good at my job and I got awards and I got a salary and all of those things that come along with it. But somebody asked me a question. They said, if you are what you do and then you don't, what are you? Stop and think about that for a second. If any one of your answers to that question is revolved around your career, which is very normal, by the way, because that's how we, it's, it's a label, it's a word, it's a containment that we can put ourselves in, right? But if that thing stops, if you stop being a wife, if your kids grow up, if your body changes, if your job changes, if your salary changes, if all of that is external, who are you, what are you, where are you? I worked with a um, spiritual coach in, surprisingly, the summer of 2020. <laughs> Shocker. Uh, I sense that as a theme a little bit. Uh, and she helped me walk through these questions. And again, it wasn't about, you know, that my name was Amanda and I was a wife and a mother and all of those beautiful things that Kimberly said I was. Those are all very true. But really what she did is had me dig deep to find my soul starting point, okay? So that's my, my, um, my current location. And as a result of that, of all that work that I was doing with her, a month and a half later, I sat down for my half or mid-year performance review and my manager said, you're doing great. We love you, but you're not happy and you don't wanna be here. Am I right? And I was like, yes, yes you are. I do not want to be here. And she said, okay, where do you wanna go? And how can we help get you there? And I will never forget that conversation. And I wish more managers had that conversation with their employees because what that taught me was that there are people out there that recognize that life just isn't about the thing that I do or what I produce. They saw in me what I didn't even see in myself which is you want something different, you want something more. So in the pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic, I left my six-figure job and I started freelancing. And this huge weight lifted off my shoulder. I pretty much put it back on my husband because he was the sole um, salary owner. But that is one of those external forces that pulled that it was, you know, I was in this corporate world and I, I thought I fit into this box and I never did, I never did. And I kept trying and then I would lose a job and I would try and then I would resign and it just never worked. So getting clarity around and, and accepting who I was was so crucial for my starting journey, okay? Now I want us to do the same exercise, but we're gonna think ahead. 
We're going to think about your individual ahs. What does that look like? So let's close our eyes again. Let's think about yourself. I don't like that question, where are you in five years? That's arbitrary, right? Because who could have predicted the pandemic, right? So don't think about it in terms of time. Don't think about it in terms of money. Don't think about it in terms of education that it would take to get there. Don't think about the societal pressures. Really give yourself the space and freedom to create your own Oz and close your eyes and ask yourself those three questions again. Where are you? Who are you? What are you? That visualization is so powerful. In 2020, when I worked with that spiritual coach and she set me on this path and I resigned from my corporate gig, I sat down and I have three journal pages that directly describe how I wanted to spend my days, where I wanted to put my energy, how I wanted to live, and I am there today. And that's the power of that vision. And it gets as detailed. My daughter does these teeny tiny drawings, and they have these little glasses and this little boat. I'm like, how do you get that small? But she's so specific. And when you're thinking about your Oz, you need to get that specific because that is what plants a seed. And then you can figure out how to go from your current location to your destination. But in those three years, I there was something, I had a lot of red and orange lines in my traffic, um, in my map, and a big part of that was drinking. Alcohol was something that was preventing me from fully experiencing not just the destination, but just the journey. And um, a year, I'm standing in front of you today, one year, one month, and one week to the day sober. Yay. Um, something that I am very, very proud of. Um, a year ago, uh, I called myself an alcoholic, and I found, my room, I found myself in, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. What's, what's interesting about this growth and this strategy is that um, in June of this year, I was hitting a roadblock in my sobriety. It just wasn't, I was like, am I really an alcoholic? Like, what? Like, maybe I could drink. And, and you go through this, and you have a lot of societal pressures, and I found myself reading this life-changing book. It's called How to Quit Like a Woman in a Society Obsessed with Alcohol. And it's by Holly Whitaker, and it was life-changing. And basically what she taught me, and I, I am so grateful for my time in AA, the things that um, I learned, the things I learned about myself, the spirituality that I gained, the connections that I made. But there was something um, that was really off about, like, the system of it. I don't know if you get this, but I'm not really a systems kind of person. Um, and I found myself in this book, and really what it said was just like, I can't screw with alcohol. I'm not a diseased person. It just doesn't sit well with me. It makes my stomach hurt. It makes me do and say things I don't like. It doesn't make me feel good. It adds to my anxiety. It doesn't take it away. It wrecks my sleep. All of these things. So just like somebody who can't do gluten, I just can't do alcohol. Plus, I also think I'm a little too old to be thinking that my bathroom floor is the most comfortable place on the earth. So I had to go through this system of clearing out myself, both physically and emotionally. And so that was removing this roadblock that was preventing me from really connecting with my source, my power, and my journey. And once I, you know, once I've removed that, this whole new world kind of opened up to me, and I'm so, so grateful for it. And I'm not saying that you have to make a dramatic life change like that, but what, I'm, what I encourage you to do is, once you figure out where you're at and where you want to go, what are the roadblocks? What are the things that are going to prevent you from getting there? Okay, and once you figure that all out, there's this crazy thing that, like, guess what? Oz isn't even the destination. Right? Like, I don't think Oz is a place. It even says it in the movie, right? Dorothy's actually in a dream. And so Oz isn't this thing that we have to get to. It's not something that we have to earn. It's not something that we have to achieve. We talked about perfection earlier today. 
Oz is this mindset that no matter where you are at is exactly where you're supposed to be, that you can be comfortable and you can be free in that space, and that you deserve to be there, and that that is your world and don't let anyone take you away from it. And if there are these internal and external pressures that are pulling you, problem solve it. Do the timeshare thing, figure out the winters and the summers and all of that, because it doesn't have to be black and white, and you also don't have to be tripping acid through a poppy field, okay? <laughs> There's definitely a way for these worlds to merge. And if the succinctness of this speech has kind of tapered off towards the end, it's because I'm actually in this element right now. I feel extremely vulnerable in front of you. A lot of my friends have asked me how the speech was going. I'm like, it's, it's good, it's good, right? <laughs> and the reason I struggled with it so much is, one, I considered myself to be the next Brene Brown, and that's just pressure that I shouldn't put on myself, <laughs> right? Um, the other thing is that it turns out awakening is a really broad topic, so there's that. Um, but I'm actually going through it right now myself. So I mentioned that in 2020, I quit my job and I envisioned this world for myself and that world was surrounded by my children, surrounded in creativity, surrounded in color, surrounded in service and surrounded, it wasn't, again, it was very abstract, right? And I didn't think about that I had this title at this company, doing this work, et cetera. It was very vague. And about a month and a half ago, on a Friday, I received a phone call from our children's elementary school, which is six houses up the street. And they said, hey, we have a long-term substitute position. Do you think you could start on Monday? And it's Friday. And I'm like, well, what is it for? They're like, fourth grade math all year. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Well, you can start on Tuesday if you need more time. <laughs> a day difference does not make, I'm sorry. So I went in and I said yes. And at the time, I had another pending offer to work with the Museum of Natural History up in New York City. But it was time crucial for me to make that decision. And because I knew where I had been, and because I had defined where I had wanted to go, and I had cleared the pathway, the answer was clear and it was quick and it was yes. So now I find myself in what some people call the burning house of public education. <laughs> but I consider myself a firefighter and I'm loving every single minute of it. And I am surrounded in the color and the brightness and the diversity and the stories of children. And I get to hug my kids throughout the day and they're still in fifth grade, so they still want to hug me, which is such a blessing. <laughs> but again, I'm wrapping up my speech here, and I'm struggling, because outside that door is another job offer that's waiting for me. And I find myself here in my Oz, and I have commitments and promises that I've made and people that I need to support back here in Kansas. And Kansas is beautiful. Actually, I don't know, I've never been to Kansas. But <laughs> I'm not saying that this life is drab and dirty and dusty, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that I don't have an answer. <laughs> I am literally standing in front of you in both of these worlds. And both feel right. And both have a time and a place. And so my awakening is this, is that I have to figure out how I'm gonna merge these two worlds together. Because I don't wanna let this go, but I'm not leaving this behind. So that's what I have for you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In looking at my notes, I do have one thing that I wanted to end with. And Wizard of Oz did a lot of amazing things. And they talked about, and you can see it, you need on this journey, you're going to need brains, you're going to need heart, and you're going to need courage. And I'm so grateful for the tools that have been given to me by the therapists and life coaches and friends and family that have supported me on this journey and have given me the brains and the heart and the courage to do that. And I just want to end with one other quote from The Wizard of Oz, and that is this. The power has always been in you, my dear. You just had to learn it for yourself. Thank you.